regardless of what season of life we are in, we always make time for things that are important to us. And if we don't make time to it, then it's not one of our high priorities. And since prayer is one of the most important things that we could be doing in the life of the church and in our own personal lives, we're going to take a few moments to pray. So I want to invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. Our Father in heaven, the one and only true God, we as your people come before you to worship you and give you thanks this morning. You are our shepherd and we are your sheep. We come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of those who believe in him. We invite you to be tangibly present with us this morning. Condescend to us, O Lord, as it were, for we know that unless you make yourself known, it is impossible to know you. Lord, we remember the 42nd Psalm that says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the, for the living God. Lord, we, lo we long and are delighted to gather in corporate worship. And we pray you would be pleased by our offerings and our singing and the posture of our heart. Lord, some people come here to Bethesda this morning empty and parched and deflated by the challenges of life. Pray that you strengthen them and bless them and fill them anew. And help us to experience this life and life abundantly that you promised in John chapter 10. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you have provided for our church during this COVID season. And we ask that you continue to do so. With the forthcoming presidential election, I pray that your people would be united as one. One shepherd and one flock. Help us to remember that being a disciple of Jesus takes precedence over our nationality. Takes precedence over our race takes precedence over our socioeconomic status, and it takes precedence over our political views. Help us, Father, to become more like your Son and show us areas in which growth is needed. And please empower us with the Holy Spirit to grow and obey you. We ask you this morning that you would use the preaching of your word to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. So now, Lord, receive our worship, and may we receive and long for more of you. Amen.
This morning we're going to be continuing in Pastor David's message our journey through the Gospel of John, and we've, we've come to chapter 10. I'm going to be reading some John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he is brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and, and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay, my, lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from the Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. At this time, any children can go out with Carolyn Miller for Children's Church. Let's pray. Father, I pray for illumination now as I preach. I pray for ears to hear, eyes to see. I pray for supernatural, divine influence to come and bless this time. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Help us, Lord, to understand this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. I've got a good amount of friends in Christian ministry. I got a friend who's getting a PhD in theology in Scotland. One of my friends serves as a missionary in Japan. Just this past week, I've heard from two friends in the great nation of Texas who are serving in youth ministry. I got friends around the world doing ministry. I love to catch up with them to see what God is doing in and through their ministries. And often they are doing well and thriving, but not all the time. Just in the past 30 days, 30 days or 40 days, I've spoken with three good friends, three godly men in three different states who are going through mistreatment in their respective ministries. I'm hearing stories of bullying, narcissism domineering attitude, verbal abuse, 
It's been painful for me to hear my friends who are good, godly men go through this kind of thing. And, and some of you, uh, you've experienced this with parents or with a bad boss. And you know what it's like to be on the receiving end of this kind of treatment. And I think of these kind of ministry leaders and I think of these kind of situations. I can't help but think how these leaders are failing to model the example of Jesus in John chapter 10. When you work with people in ministry, when you do life at home, when you go to work, when you're around people, there's conflict is going to be expected. We're, we're different and we're fallen in many ways. But during those ugly moments when our hearts motives come out and people see it, we want to know that people love us and see us and are going to accept us for who we are. Tim Keller says it this way, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. We, we desire to be fully known and fully loved. And in this passage, teaches that in Jesus, for those who have trusted in Christ, that's exactly what we have. It teaches that Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for those who believe in him. And we start in the first verse where Jesus says, truly, truly. He repeats himself a couple of times. In the Old Testament, when a prophet wanted to speak on behalf of God, he would say, thus says the Lord, and then say something. But Jesus doesn't have to say that because he is the Lord, and his teaching should be received as authoritative. And in the first five verses, he gives this figure of speech language. You might call it a proverb. It's, it's another one of those times where Jesus speaks, people have no idea what he's saying, and then he unpacks what he's saying. And he talks about sheep and shepherds because in the ancient Near East, we live in the West, Western part of the world. This was the Eastern part of the world. Farming and agriculture and sheep and shepherds, this was common metaphorical language to use. This was common real life stuff for people. So Jesus wants to make a point and he uses sheep and shepherds to make this point. And this story must be understood in the background of Ezekiel chapter 34, the Old Testament. I know Ezekiel is everyone's favorite book of the Bible, but in the middle of Ezekiel, there's a, there's a passage there where the Lord asks Ezekiel to prophesy. A prophecy is a prediction that's going to come true with 100% accuracy. Ask him to prophesy about the shepherds because they were failing as shepherds. They weren't taking care of the sheep. They weren't helping them or blessing them or feeding them. They were feeding themselves. And God had enough of it. And he said, just... Just prophesy against these people. They're supposed to be helping and serving, but they're not. And that prophecy was to predict the day when Jesus Christ, who's the Lamb of God, would come and be the ultimate shepherd. And he is, and that comes right now in John chapter 10. So that Ezekiel passage points to John chapter 10, and here we are. And Jesus says, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way... That man is a thief and a robber. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about thieves and robbers. People back then had a lot of sheep, put them inside this sheep pen where they couldn't get out. A wolf or a bear couldn't eat them. And uh, people would, there was a gatekeeper who would work right by the door. So any reasonable, sane person would simply walk in through the door. But a thief and a robber tried to go around a different way and climb in to take advantage of the sheep. This is, this is a metaphor that Jesus is using. He's trying to say that the religious leaders, the Sadducees and Pharisees, are like the thieves and robbers climbing in the other way to take advantage of the sheep. That's what Jesus is doing. Once again, he's calling out the religious leaders of that day. And she, sheep in the Bible are often depicted as Christians, as God's people, and Jesus is the shepherd. And the religious leaders of that day were taking advantage of the sheep, belittling them, expelling them. This just happened in John chapter 9. When you read your Bible, it's very helpful, or dare I say essential, to not just read one verse in isolation, but to read the stories before it and the stories after it to help you understand what you're reading. And just before this, in John chapter 9, there's a man who was born blind. Jesus heals him. And then after he's blind, the religious leaders see him and they're like, hey, how'd you get healed? What's going on? Tell, me, tell us about this. And they're, they're jealous. They're envious. 
And he just gives them a straight up answer, Jesus healed me. And so it says they kicked him out. Likely means they kicked him out of the synagogue. For what? Just, just for being on the recipient end of healing. That, I mean, that's, that's abuse. And this was a small example of the kinds of things that the religious leaders were doing back then. And so what Jesus starts to do is he's calling out the religious leaders for their abuse of God's people. And then he continues with a comparison of the true shepherd versus the thieves and robbers. Verse 2 and 3. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus is the true shepherd and now he's comparing himself his character, what he's like as a religious leader versus the Pharisees and Sadducees and what they were like. They're like thieves and robbers who want to choke the sheep and take advantage of the sheep and belittle them and abuse them. And Jesus comes and says, I, I'm the true shepherd. I love the sheep. I care for them. I help them. Even more, you look at this intimate and close relationship with the sheep. It says that he calls his own sheep personally by name and leads them out. If you're in business, you probably heard of this guy named Dale Carnegie. He wrote a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. I listened to it on Audible, but the guy's voice on Audible was so scary to me so I stopped listening to it on audible he was just really off-putting me but I did capture a couple of quotes he says this about a name he says a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language he says the average person is more interested in his or her own name than in all the other names on earth put together you know, a couple who is pregnant with a child might wisely decide not to share the name before the baby's born. They're not trying to be rude or arrogant. It's just that there's something special about the name. They don't want the facial expressions and the unsolicited opinions of family to bother them. They're not trying to rob you. They're just like, hold on, it's going to be nine months. I'll share the name with everyone. There's something special about the name. And it says here that Jesus knows his sheep by name and personally leads them out. Look at this, this intimacy, this knowledge that God has of each and every one of his people. I mean, we live in a world with seven plus billion people. For many people, uh, many Christians, I've heard people say this a lot, where they say they're going through something and they wonder, they say, you know, well, I don't want to bother God in prayer. Or I don't want to burden God because he's, there's seven billion people on this planet. Look of all the needs and injustices in the world. Or you might feel very small. Or you might be going through things and you have people in your life who you feel like they're not loving me well. They're not serving me. Does anyone see what I go through? There's a, there's a deep desire in your heart to be seen. To know with certainty that someone cares. And the Bible teaches that Jesus is the one who cares. L listen to the way the psalmist puts it. Psalm 139, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Like individualism is often bad, and being selfish is not good, but self-care. I mean, if you look at the Bible, there's, always, there's a lot of these you, there's me, I language, this personal, intimate relationship that God has with each, which each and every one of his people. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. It's impossible for God to learn anything about you. It's impossible for God to learn anything. He's omniscient, which means all-knowing. He's omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. Of course he can help. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. So when you sit in this pew at church,
when you rise from your chair at work or when you lay down at bed at night after a long day, you can have 100% confidence if you've trusted in Christ that the God of the Bible sees, knows, cares about every objection, fear, doubt, sin, concern that you have. So let's, let's dismiss this sort of, does God care, does God see? That, that is just sort of being informed by our own insecurities. We, we see in Scripture that God does. And if it's a big deal to you, it's a big deal to Him. Don't let these, oh, I, this, is, this, this is just a small thing. If it's weighing you down, bring it to the Lord in prayer. Cast your burdens on Him. Approach Him. That's the kind of intimacy and relationship He wants to have with each and every one of His people. Notice it says, his sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep and leads them out. This doesn't apply to people who have not trusted in Christ. Uh, for those who have not put their faith in Christ, it says, the Bible says that God's wrath is on them. And they're depicted as servants of Satan and they're, they're depicted as wolves. And although all people are created in the image of God and should be treated with equal value, dignity, respect... And there's much we can learn from people who don't possess the faith. What we see in this passage is a special, unique kind of love that only those who have trusted in Christ get to enjoy. If you're a married man in this room and you've been at Bethesda for a long time, and you know a lot of the women here, you, you, you care about the women. You love the women in a general way. When they're in the hospital, you're concerned. When they're going through something, you, you pray for them. Uh, when they're rejoicing, you're happy because you care. But if you're married, you know your wife has a special, unique, specific, loyal love that she gets to enjoy that other women do not. Same with God's love. He loves all people in a general way, but he loves his people in a special, particular, exclusive way. This is yet one of 100 million reasons why it is better to trust in Christ and follow him than not. He knows each by name. He says their name and they follow out. This is metaphorical language. The sheep hear his voice. We don't have Jesus going from church to church and fleshly, you know, going to churches to preach today. But we do have the Bible. And when we read our Bible for the right reasons and seek to consume God's word... We can trust we're hearing his voice and we can follow him. We can follow him better the more we spend time in God's word. He leads the sheep out. He doesn't push them. He doesn't shove them. He doesn't threaten them. There is a, there's a mutual relational capital built in between the shepherd and the sheep. And Jesus, the true shepherd, is the one who loves his sheep, feeds them, protects them from wolves. This is protecting us from evil and going after the ones who've fallen away and rebuking those who act foolishly. We see the shepherd and the sheep together, and the sheep are following the shepherd. Where are they going? Verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus says he's the door. Some of your translations will say gate. He says, anyone who enters by me will find pasture. This is metaphorical language for saying, anyone who comes to saving faith in me, anyone who believes in me will be saved. Will be saved from God's wrath. Will have a place in heaven. Will have eternal life. He's using medical, metaphorical language to show what it means to, to be a part of the people of God. It's simply entering through the door by believing in Christ. He says we'll experience these green pastures and life and life abundantly. That the green pastures is metaphorical language. The life and life abundantly. It doesn't mean that if you come to Christ or you, you become a Christian, you have health, wealth, and riches. It doesn't mean that you'll be spared from earthly trouble. It doesn't mean you'll always get what you want when you want. It's not, it's not what it's talking about. But it does mean to convey the blessings and assurance of God's love and provision for those who trust in him. So we learn that Jesus is the way to God. He's the door, the gate to a saving relationship with him. But we also learn that Jesus is the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. When I was in seminary, which is like graduate school for those who are training to be theologians or missionaries or pastors or whatever it is, we had to take this really hard test 
called the Bible Content Exam. It was like four hours long, and on, you have to complete all your hours, which was like 90-something hours. You had to serve a church for 400 hours. I mean, you had so many requirements, and in addition, you had to pass this test, which was notoriously hard. Uh, so much so that people were like, the day before graduation, were still trying to pass it and try. And smart people. It's a very hard test. And I, don't, I don't remember all the questions. I try not to think of those days anymore specifically this test, but one question was this. Uh, the first time I, 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 I took it and I, I saw this question is, fill in the blank, list out the seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. I'm like, oh yeah, I have no idea. I'm like, I am hungry. I am thirsty. I, I, th this is a thing, like the I am statements in the Gospel of John, if you read any literature studies on it, this comes up over and over again. So there's seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection of the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true vine. And Jesus says, I am, I am, over and over again. This is meant to stir your mind to remember the Old Testament in which God is about to rescue he's about to release the israelites from egypt and stuttering moses goes to him and says all right who should i say who's sending me just tell him i am who i am is sending you this is another way of god revealing himself as god and so when jesus says this i am i am i am he, what he's trying to say subtly is i'm god this is one of the main reasons why john wrote his gospel so that his readers would understand that this jesus 30-something-year-old Palestinian Jewish poor single person is not just any ordinary carpenter. He's the Messiah. He's God. And Jesus continues the contrast language. He, he starts by contrasting the shepherd versus the thieves and robbers. Now he's going to contrast the shepherd versus the hired hand. Some of your translations will say hireling. It's a, a hireling here is a person who he, he came to watch the sheep he was paid. He was ready to do the job, but he, he, he cowered away when it got hard. Uh, wolves or bears would come, and he didn't use his staff to protect the sheep. He left. He was passive. He was cowardly. When it's time to make a hard decision, the hired hand, he cowers away. And what Jesus is saying is like, I'm not like the hired hand. I'm 100% I'm committed to my people. Some of you have had people leave you. In marriage relationships, parents, mom or dad, friends, they let you down. As a result in your heart, you, you may, maybe you, you have a hard time trusting people or maybe you don't like when people get too close to you because you don't want them to love you and see you and then leave and then break your heart again. You don't want that to happen. As a result, you're a little bit cynical or skeptical of some people when they're really nice. It, I, I can understand why you'd, you'd be like that. Because of the trauma of the divorce or a parent leaving or a, a difficult relationship. That, 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 that's the attitude of a, uh, that's a description of a hired hand. Jesus is saying, listen, I'm not like the hired hand. I'm not going to leave when it gets hard. I'm 100% committed forever, eternally committed to everyone who believes in me. So other people will let you down over and over again, but Jesus never will. So you can draw near to him in a regular relationship knowing that he's always going to be there. He is not like the hired hand. He has a tough job, a hard job. D.A. Carson speaks of the shepherd's life. He says, many people in the West are inclined to think of shepherds as sentimental beings, perhaps somewhat effeminate, with their arms full of cuddly lambs. But the shepherd's job was tiring, manly, and sometimes dangerous. When it's tiring, when it's dangerous, when it's difficult, the true shepherd, Jesus, is not ever going to leave his people. He's 100% committed to those who've trusted in him. He's not like the hired hand. He's not like the hireling. Some of you, you are, uh, you know, you are not a shepherd, right? Maybe, you know, pastors are often co compared to shepherds. You know, maybe not a pastor, a hired hand. Maybe you're not in farming. But 
as a, as a person, as a one who's trusted in Christ, this applies to you. Not only to trust in Jesus, but also more and more with your life and draw near to him knowing he's not going to leave. But also as you consider your relationships and people in your life. Listen to this quote. This guy says, he says, if the preacher exercises too much power, he can be fought. If he's too weak, he can be ignored. Um, shepherds weren't weak and they weren't too strong. They, ha- they love the sheep, they take care of the sheep, they bless the sheep, but they also had a staff that was for wolves and bears, but also for discipline. And for some of you in your own life, if you're not a shepherd, but you have people under you in some sense, right? if you're a parent, you have children who are under you. If you're the boss at work, you got people under you. Maybe you don't have people under you, you have people side by side, like a spouse or friend or co-workers, and this matters in the context of your relationships. So the goal is neither to be too strong to where people will challenge us and we'll end up hurting people, may not realize it, or so weak that we actually not help people. We want to we avoid both extremes. And to get this more concrete, we say category A is too strong, category B is too weak, category A, there's so many good things about you. You're ambitious, smart, talented, competent, you produce, you get stuff done. And yet, for the people under you or side by side, have you considered that you might come in too heavy-handed sometimes? There might be a better way. Perhaps you yell at people or verbally abuse people in your life when really God calls his people to be patient and to work at influencing them another way. For your grandparents, as opposed to trying to control and micromanage your kids and how they raise their kids, Maybe you can be more gentle and not come across as a micromanager as opposed to incessantly criticizing people. You can be patient with them. Some of you, when you discover someone uh, has a different political view than you, you automatically dismiss them. You're constantly criticizing people who are different than you. Part of this mentality is like being too strong. Maybe being domineering. Where domineering in the original language can be translated as a lord or master. You're trying to, trying to get in someone's life. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the authority figure here. And you are. But there's better ways to influence people. Through the ways of God. Through being patient and loving and kind and long-suffering. Just like how God is with you. So when you remember the gospel. When you remember that Christ has forgiven you for all your sins you'll be more quick to forgive other people when they make sins or when they mess up. When you remember that God is patient with you, you'll be more patient with other people. There could be an idol in your heart. If you want to feel significant, you want to feel powerful, and maybe you, you lord yourself over people, but the gospel says you are significant because of Christ. He chose you, loves you, and is walking with you through the storms of your life. There's an idol here of control. There's an idol here of results and performance. And when people don't meet your standards, you end up coming in too strong. There's a better way. Remember the gospel. Remember how God treats you and how God is patient with you. And that will help you to be patient with others. On the other side, category B, there's too timid or not strong enough. There's so much good in you as well. Very forgiving, patient, and gentle kind, so helpful in so many ways. And yet, like the hired hand, sometimes you cower away when it makes you uncomfortable. Instead of saying no to a request, you overcommit all the time because the approval of people is very important to you. Instead of having the courage to speak up or address a sinful pattern you see in someone's life, you kind of just enable them and let them go. This ends up actually enabling people more than helping them. It's a form of selfishness. There's, there's a big need to be affirmed, to be approved, to be seen. And yet, you're going to people for that and not God to that. The gospel says that you are loved, chosen, affirmed, seen in Him. What more do you need? If you make a hard decision or if someone dislikes you, if you, you come into a meeting 
and you're prayed up, and you thought about what you're going to say, and you really love your job, you really love these people you're trying to help, and they dislike you or they leave, you still have the smile of God forever. So the remedy for category B is, is, is not to try to be someone like you're not, but to go to God for this deep need to be affirmed and approved. You have that already in Christ. Tim Keller is a well-known pastor in New York City. He recently had cancer and a big health scare. And, uh, you know, he didn't have anything wrong with him. And three weeks later, something was really wrong with him. He had cancer. And he asked his Facebook followers and Twitter followers and Instagram followers to pray for them. Over close to a million people. And he gave an update, a good update, a positive update. He says this. Our situation has driven us to seek God's face as we've never before. He's giving us more of his sense presence, more freedom from our besetting sins, more dependence on his word. Things that we had sought for years, but only under these circumstances are we finding them. He's turning 70 later this month. Look at his attitude. I'm besetting sins or being killed. I'm becoming more dependent on God. I want to continue to grow. Like Christian growth is not just for young people. It's for anyone who's a follower of Christ. And so in our American culture, sometimes what people do is they retire from their job and they sort of check out from God as well. And the call is, no, God's not done with you. He wants to continue to shape you and grow you and meet with you. And he longs to have a close, personal, intimate relationship with you. This is not just for younger people. This is for all people. And some people say, well, this is just the way I am. I've been like this since I was 20. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the gospel. And by the power of God, you can change. Part of you has to decide, do I want to change? Do I want to keep growing or do I want to check out? God is not done with you. And like a good shepherd, he's pursuing you. And those who fall away or stray, he comes after them, usually through the voice of someone else. And God is saying, if you're still breathing, I'm not done with you. I want to conform you increasingly into the image of Christ. So don't let age or don't let where you're at in life to say, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to pursue other interests. No, God is number one. And allow him to continue to shape you. He's the one who laid down his life for you. That's, that's what Jesus says here in this passage. He's the one who wants to help you and serve you. In fact, you were on his mind 2,000 plus years ago. Verse 16 says this, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. I have other sheep of this fold. You know what he's talking about? You. If you're a Christian. This is, this is 2,000 plus years ago in the Middle East. And Jesus is thinking about all the other people who are going to come to saving faith in him later. At, at this point in salvation history, the good news of the Messiah, Christ, had only gone to the Israelites, the people of Israel. It was a strictly Jewish thing. But with Paul, it opened up to Gentiles. Gentiles means non-Jewish. So if you're Jewish, you're Jewish. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. There's two categories. At this point, it was only for Jewish people. And eventually, it opens up so that you and I can be grafted in. And Christ was like, I have to lay down my life because there's more sheep coming. There's more people, i.e. you and I, who are going to come to saving faith in me. And Jesus says, no one, no one abuses me and takes my life from me. I gladly, sacrificially lay it down for those who want to believe in me. He's the ultimate shepherd. In the Old Testament, King David is portrayed as the typical shepherd. You know what he did? He risked his life for the sheep. He really did. But Jesus doesn't just risk his life for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. He was spit on and mocked and crucified and gladly laid down his life for those who would believe in him. And the more you draw closer to him, the more you find your sense of identity and worth from what he thinks and now what other people think. And the more you won't be too strong or not strong enough. We're going to pray. I want to invite you to close your eyes this morning.
We're going to do something a little bit different. The band can come up after I pray, but I just, I just want you to just close your eyes if you don't mind. I just want you to consider your life. People around you, children, grandchildren, spouse, co-workers. Ask yourself, am I coming in too strong? Am I overbearing? Or am I being too timid? Think of ways perhaps you've sinned against God, sinned against people. There might be repentance this week. There might be a phone call need to be made. There, there might be confession. I just want to encourage you to remember the gospel. There's good news. There's hope this morning. No matter where you're at, you can change. Just even now, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and to help you. Sit here in silence for a few minutes and then I'll pray. Father, we confess that we have failed over and over again, all of us, in many ways. Lord, we have come in too strong. We have become overbearing for people in our lives. Maybe we don't even realize it. Or perhaps, Father, we are enablers, and Lord, you call us to be helpers. Pray, God, that you just ignite us with a sense of boldness and courage, but also with compassion. Lord, we pray that you fill us and help us to look to the, the true shepherd, the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know you're 100% for your people eternally, and there's nothing that can change that. And Lord, I pray for those in their retired years and on. I pray that you would continue to bless them and encourage them and to show them that you love them and you're for them. And you want them to continually draw near to you. Scripture says if we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. Lord, help them. Help us. We need your mercy this morning. In Christ's name, amen.